Hello and welcome to MTA 98-364 and the first section is 1.1 understand how data is stored in tables. First we're going to look at the objectives for this section. The objectives are to understand what a table is and how it relates to the data that will be stored in a database to understand columns and fields, and to understand rows and records. They're the objectives of the section, but first we need to look at some general concepts and questions. So the first question is, what is a database? A database is an organized collection of data, typically stored in electronic format. Database is actually a term that can be used more generally, so even a pile of paper, say in a filing cabinet at home, could be considered to be a database. But in this unit, we're really talking about electronically stored databases. A database allows you to store, organize, and retrieve data. And databases are usually organized using structures such as files, fields, rows, and columns. Now let me just explain something that's really quite important here. If you wanted to store information, say, about your contacts, things like their name and address and phone number, you could actually store that information in a file on a PC, maybe just a Word document or a text file, something like that. And then if you wanted to find information, such as somebody's phone number, you could look in the file and find it. But supposing you wanted to store their email address as well, and maybe their date of birth, how would you find all of the people who have birthdays next month? You'd have to go right through the file, check everybody's date of birth, and find the ones with the date of birth beginning first of next month through to the last day of next month. So in principle, most types of data you can store in a file and then you can look at that file and go through it and find the information that you want. With a database though, you're usually dealing with much more complex information and your requirements in terms of both managing the information and finding the information that you want tend to be much more complex. So although we can just store information in individual files, for example, we use databases to deal with much more complex requirements, both in terms of storing and managing the data and in terms of retrieving the information that we need. Now let's look at another aspect of what a database is. A database typically has two main components. It comprises the files holding the physical database. So this is a selection of files on a device. And then it also has what's called the Database Management System or DBMS software. And that's the software that's used to access the data. It's also the software that is used to manage the data to make sure that the structure of the database is kept secure and if you need to make changes to the structure of the database, the database management system is the tool that you'll use to make those changes. So what is a database management system, a DBMS? It's responsible for enforcing the database structure, including, but this is not an exhaustive list, maintaining the relationships between the data items in the database ensuring that the data is stored correctly, making sure that the rules defining data relationships are not violated, and recovering all data to a point of known consistency in the case of system failures. So the DBMS has an awful lot to do. If you can imagine that some people are adding data to your database, maybe somebody else is changing the structure of the database, other people are deleting data, and you've maybe got users who are retrieving and updating that data as well. The DBMS needs to make sure that everything is kept in shape, consistent and obeys all of the rules that you've defined. Now let's consider an example. In fact, this is one of the examples I'm going to be using throughout the course. Let's look at a parts database used by a hardware company. Maybe a company that makes parts and sells other people's parts and has retail outlets, online outlets, and so on. 
Let's suppose that typically in the sort of parts that they keep, the data includes part numbers, stock levels, how many items of that part number have we got in stock? What's the price of one of those parts? What's the price to the public? What's the price to tradespeople? How many of those have we sold? Who did we sell them to? Give me a description of one of those parts, maybe a picture of one of them as well. Now nowadays, all around us, whatever we're doing, people have databases with this sort of information in them. It's important to organize this data so that it can be used easily and efficiently for many different purposes. Just think of all the people that might need to use that data. Tradespeople who've got to look at what's available and decide what to order before they embark on a project. Members of the public who want to buy parts, perhaps spare parts, that they're going to use in their house. Salespeople in stores who are going to make sales of those parts. And maybe somebody in the warehouse who needs to check stock levels. So let's now look at the basics of how we store this kind of information in a database. And the most fundamental part of database storage is the table. And what I've got here is a very limited table of information about parts. I've included some of the information about parts that I've mentioned already. So we have a part number, a category, a subcategory, description and price. Each of the parts in this database corresponds to a horizontal row in this table. So the first part has part number 17122. It's in the category of extractor fans and the subcategory of extractor fans for bathrooms. And the description of this part is Manro's axial 20 watt pull cord bathroom fan and its price excluding tax is 12.25. The second item in this parts table has a part number of 54393, a category of door handles, a subcategory of door packs modern, and so on. Now the terminology we use here is very important terminology. One of those rows corresponds to a record in that table. So the table you can see there has eight records in it at the moment. Now later on we'll have quite a few more than eight records, but there are eight records at the moment. Each record includes a number of what are called attributes. So if we look at that first record again, its first attribute is its part number. Now that part number, sometimes called an attribute, it's sometimes called a field. And it's sometimes called a column. Don't let yourself get too confused by all these expressions. Think of the rows as horizontal and the columns as vertical in a very similar way to a spreadsheet. I'll talk more about spreadsheets a little bit later on. But in this table we have eight records and we have five columns. And the columns are sometimes also referred to as fields or attributes. So for the first record in that table the value of its part number field is 17122. For the fifth record in the table, what's the value of its subcategory attribute? It's door packs modern. And what's the value in the price column of the last record in this table? It's 1495. So that's tables, records and rows, and columns, fields and attributes. Let's move on now to queries. What is a query? A database query is an inquiry into the database. So for example, how many of those have we sold? What is the price of one of those? How many of those do we have in stock? They're all queries related to this parts database. In modern relational databases we create queries using SQL which stands for Structured Query Language. And in Microsoft SQL Server, we use Microsoft's extension to SQL, which is called Transact SQL, or T-SQL. Another term you're going to need to understand is an index. What is an index? Well, suppose you've got a table consisting of thousands or millions of records. 
And let's think of that parts table that we looked at just eight rows of just now. Supposing we had 100,000 parts like that. And I said to you, I want you to tell me how many of our parts cost 1495 Well, if you had to go through thousands and thousands and thousands of records looking at the price and checking with its 1495 it would take a long time. Now, you could say, well, supposing I sorted everything by price, I'd just go down to where it says 1495 and count from there. It might still take a while, but at least it would be a shorter job than the first method of doing it. Well, that's fine if you've sorted the list on price, but supposing the next question was to find everything in a particular category or in a particular subcategory. And one of the problems you have with databases is that you may want to do queries, you may want to get information based on all sorts of different criteria. Now in order to deal with many criteria, we can create many indexes. An index helps to speed up retrieval by providing the location of the required item in an equivalent way to the index in a book. Database indexes need to be created and updated though and their maintenance does add to the overhead of work that the DBMS has to do. This is an important point. Index is a great idea. You pretty much can't do without indexes when you're working with databases. But if you, say, have a pretty big parts database and maybe a couple of dozen indexes, every time you make a change to some data, the database system has to update the indexes. Now, that may not be a huge job, but it does need to be done every time. So it does tend to add a little bit of an overhead of work to the database system. And also, indexes use up more space. Now let's look at another term you're going to come across. What is a database server? Now, in fact, a database server has two pretty much completely different meanings. And sometimes people get them confused and interchange them and so on. But you're going to hear this term used in two different contexts. The name is used in two often confused ways. First of all, a database server is a powerful computer that is configured specifically to host a database. Particularly in big organizations where they may have big databases, they may have computers or even whole groups of computers devoted to handling their databases. These are referred to as database servers. They are not used for things like email. It's not like a PC you might have on your desk or in the study at home. This is a computer that's tuned to looking after databases. The second context is the DBMS, the Database Software System, the Database Management System. These database server management systems are usually referred to as database servers. And one example of a database server software system is Microsoft SQL Server that I've mentioned already and that is the main software system that we're going to be using within this course. And this is the system that I'm going to use to demonstrate many of the tools and techniques associated with databases. Now I mentioned earlier on that basically a database has two components. It has the storage and then it has the DBMS. The next question is, given that part of the database is all of the stored data, how is that data actually stored on a computer, on a database server computer? Well, it's held in a set of files. And in the case of Microsoft SQL Server, data is stored in three different types of file. The main body of data, what's referred to as the primary files, are held in a set of MDF files. These are files with an extension of MDF. And this can hold user-defined objects, tables like the parts table that we saw earlier, views, which we're going to talk about later, and the system tables, the DBMS's own tables, where it maintains information about things like who's allowed to use the database. Now, in the case of a big database, you may well find that you need to spread this storage onto other disks, possibly even on other devices, maybe over a network. 
secondary files that are used for this additional storage are held in what are called NDF files. So these are, if you like, extensions. This is where you do the equivalent of building an extension onto the house to make a bit more space. And then the third type of file is an LDF file, and these are the transaction log files. We won't really talk about transaction log files until fairly near the end of the course, but basically every time somebody makes a change to the data in the database, we would normally log that change, and we might use that log of transactions to recover from a disaster. Now we'll look into this in quite a bit more detail towards the end of the course, but basically you do need to take copies of the database for security reasons from time to time, and sometimes you may take these copies, what are referred to as backups, and your transaction logs, and rebuild your database, but more of that later. Now so far I've talked about databases in generic terms, but there are different types of database, and I want to look now at the three main types of database. The first type of database is what's called the flat type database, which is a two-dimensional table consisting of rows and columns. And we've already seen a very simple example of this with that parts table that I showed you. The second type is a hierarchical database, and a hierarchical database is like an upside-down tree structure. In this tree structure, a parent can have many children, but a child can only have one parent. The third type, and the type that is really the most important to us on this course, is the relational database. It's a similar principle to the hierarchical database, but a parent can have many children and a child can have many parents. So let's start with a flat type database. You can see here, this is a simple database. It's only got eight parts in it. It's only got five attributes, so each of the parts we have five pieces of information about, but it's a database. You could have hundreds, thousands, millions more parts. You could give the parts more, dozens more, hundreds more attributes. Now, it's a perfectly feasible way of doing things, but the trouble with flat type databases is that you don't easily get those relationships. So, for instance, here we've got duplication of the category door handles all over the place, and we've got subcategories within that category and so on. And what happens is that you finish up proliferating duplicate copies of lots of pieces of information because you don't set up the relationships that are fundamental to the structure of the database. So we don't have something somewhere that says there is a category called door handles. Now when we move on to the hierarchical database we go a good part of the way to solving this particular problem. Now with a hierarchical database which is like an inverted tree, each parent can have many children each child can have only one parent, each child can have multiple children itself. So this parts database in a hierarchical database would look a bit like this. You'd say, right, category A, this might be something like door handles. And then you might divide that up into subcategories and say within the category of door handles, we've maybe got bathroom door handles and we've got kitchen door handles. And within the subcategory of bathroom door handles, we might have part 1265 and part 1762. Each of those two may be assemblies with individual parts, so they may have children as well. So as you can see, you can build up a hierarchical structure for your database. So we can arrive at the situation where we have subcategory A1, is itself a child, although it's a child of only one parent, category A. It has multiple children, and those children in turn, part 1762 for example, may have its own children, but it only has one parent. Now the problem is that within the database that's fine if we only have one hierarchy. Let's think about a different database. What about a database of movies? What hierarchy would you use in a database of movies? Would you perhaps have a hierarchy based on movie production companies? 
So maybe you'd have all movies at the top and then you might have MGM as one branch, Warner Brothers as another branch. Or maybe you'd arrange it by genre of movie. So you might have a comedy branch and an action branch. What would you do about a movie that was an action comedy? Now the problem is that in real life many of the databases that we create and use are more complicated than a single hierarchy and they need to accommodate many hierarchies. So just moving back to this parts database again, what if you wanted part 1762 there to actually have many parents and the parents it's got are actually parents in different hierarchies. So again with the movie example, you might want a movie to be an MGM movie so it's in that branch of the production company hierarchy but it's a comedy so you may want it to be in the comedy branch of the genre hierarchy and that's really where the third type of database comes in the relational database because a relational database basically means that a child can have multiple parents which means that it can feature in a number of different hierarchies so what is a relational database? It has similarities to a hierarchical database but a child can have many parents. This really means that a child can be involved in many hierarchies. It can have many relationships at once. And so on this course we're going to concentrate on relational databases. So each table in a relational database can be thought of as a spreadsheet i.e. a two-dimensional array of data. It's easy to add or delete columns or attributes or fields. When you're adding or deleting columns you are changing the design of the database. If you add, update or delete rows you're changing the data in the database. You're actually putting new records in deleting records or changing the ones that are already there. So adding, updating or deleting rows is data maintenance. Adding or deleting columns is database design. And very importantly, data can be sorted on any column. So one of the features is that if you want to sort data so that you can easily focus on a particular value of a particular attribute, you can do that easily with a relational database. Comparing workbooks such as Microsoft Excel workbooks to database tables, a spreadsheet which will be referred to as a workbook in Microsoft Excel can contain multiple worksheets. This is the equivalent of a database containing multiple tables. So a worksheet column is a database field, a worksheet row is a database record. A worksheet column can contain data that might be blank. So you might have a blank cell in a worksheet in Excel. This would be stored as a null value in a database and in some cases, as we'll see later on, nulls are not allowed, but more of that later. And there's one final thing to talk about in relation to the basic understanding of databases and that is calculated values. Although we generally tend to store values, many values in a database, you can also have calculated values in an equivalent way to the way that you can have calculated values in an Excel workbook. In a spreadsheet you can calculate values for some cells from the values on other cells. You can do that in databases as well. For example, we could calculate the price with tax in our parts database based on the current tax rate. So given that the price excluding tax was one of the attributes we had in our simple table earlier in this unit, it's probably a better idea to store the price without tax and then have some record of the current tax rate and then whenever we want to find the price with tax we can apply the current tax rate. Calculated values can be generated when we produce a report or when we display something on a screen. So that's it for this unit. Just let me remind you of the objectives. Understand what a table is and how it relates to the data that will be stored in a database. Understand columns and fields. 
understand rows and records. So I hope you've got a good handle on all of those now. There's a set of questions now for you to answer, a little Q&A session, just to make sure that you've understood all of the main points in this unit. I'll leave you with those, and I'll see you in the next unit.